Good afternoon. Welcome to all participants. Welcome to our distinguished speakers to this very timely event on the unresolved issues around glyphosate, one of the world's most used and most debated pesticides. And first of all, I would like to warmly thank the four members of European Parliament that are hosting this event, uh, which are Jitte Guteland from the SND, Michelle Rivasi and Thomas Weitz from the Greens, and Anja Hasekamp uh, of the Left. And uh, they all have a particular interest in this topic because they were all member of the European Parliament Pest Committee. Uh, that's a number of years back in the midst of the glyphosate controversy um, was a, a special committee set up to investigate the flaws of the pesticide regulation in the EU. This event is also supported by NGOs that were involved in the Stop Glyphosate ECI, European Citizens Initiative which are Pesticide Action Network, Some of Us, Health and Environment Alliance, Global 2000, Friends of the Earth Austria, and Corporate Europe Observatory. My name is Nina Holland. I work with Corporate Europe Observatory, and um, we are a lobby watchdog based here in Brussels. So welcome everyone, and I would first like to give you a few household remarks. This webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be made available to participants afterwards. There is translation uh, provided into French, which you can find under the translation button. And we invite journalists uh, particularly to ask, uh, if you want to ask questions, please use the Q&A button. Uh, the questions will then be seen by the organizers and they will transfer them to me. And in case we do not have enough time to address all the questions, then please leave your contact details or an email address um, so we can get back to you afterwards. As I said, glyphosate, a very timely topic, as we're again in the middle of a reauthorization process here in the EU. Um, this process last time around caused a lot of controversy and led to an end result for a new approval of only five years. In the US, uh, it, sorry, to recap, in, the, in 2015, the WHO Cancer Research Institute, IARC, concluded that glyphosate is a probable carcinogen in humans. And that should have led normally to an EU ban on the product. However, the EU agencies and institutions decided on a compromise that was very controversial, which was a five-year approval. This means that now, by now, it is almost expired and we are again in a reauthorization process. In the US, the IARC verdict led to tens of thousands of litigations, which caused the Monsanto papers to be disclosed. These were internal documents that showed how Monsanto misabused science and manipulated the evidence in order to keep the product on the market. And in Europe, this was one of the motivations for the European Parliament to set up the Pest Committee. So we are again in this reauthorization process. And just yesterday, the European Chemicals Agencies decided that again, based on uh, the buyer's dossier for glyphosate, that glyphosate is not a carcinogen. It is toxic for aquatic life. It is uh, causing severe eye damage, but it's not carcinogenic according to EGA. So today we will be speaking with five uh, distinguished guests on the unresolved issues regarding the risks and harm of allowing the glyphosate-based products on the market for widespread use in the environment, for instance, through agriculture. I will introduce the speakers one by one uh, before giving the floor. Then it will be followed by short reactions and questions from the members of European Parliament. And then we'll have the question and answer session. So first, let's go to Helmut Butcher, uh, biochemist at Global 2000, Friends of the Earth Austria. And he was also the co-initiator of the Stop Glyphosate ECI. And you will take stock of the uh, th demands and what happened with the demands of the successful European Citizens Initiative. You have five minutes. Please have the floor. Helmut, you're still muted. Mute me? Okay. Yes. All fine. So. It's, now I have to talk quite quick. 
Thank you very much, Nina, and thanks to the European Parliament for inviting me uh, to talk here on behalf of the ECI, uh, the European Citizens Initiative Stop Glyphosate. When we successfully completed uh, the ECI in 2017, we had three demands. Number one, the Commission should ban glyphosate. Number two, the approval of pesticides should no longer be based on secret industry studies. And number three, the Commission should introduce binding pesticide reduction targets. Today, five years later, we can say that at least some things have changed to the better even if yesterday the decision of ECHA impressively has shown that it was clearly not enough. But let's start with the positive. Our third demand for binding pesticide reduction targets was not answered in the first run, but three years later, we were pleasantly surprised by the Commission with the Farm to Fork strategy that aims to reduce the use and risk of pesticides in the EU by 50% until 2030. A commission proposal to make this important pesticide reduction target legally binding was expected for the second, uh, I think 23rd of March, but postponed and will now hopefully, we also count here on the European Parliament uh, to, to make pressure, hopefully come on schedule on the second, uh, 22nd of June. And our second demand, reform of the regulatory system, was rewarded with a major change in the European law, ending half a century of secrecy about industry studies in all regulatory processes um, around uh, foodstuff. However, our first and central demand to ban glyphosate was rejected. But reauthorization was granted for only five years, as Nina has already explained, instead of the 15 years initially planned. We thought that these five years would be used to resolve the outstanding issues surrounding glyphosate. And there were enough uh, such issues and unresolved questions to write the whole book about. I can say that because I wrote such a book and these questions became even more explosive when US courts uncovered scientific fraud committed by Monsanto over decades to keep glyphosate on the market. One of these unresolved issues is, how can it be that a rather simple scientific question such as, does a specific test substance damage DNA? In the case of glyphosate and its formulations was unanimously answered no by the 46 industry studies that addressed the question in 2015. However, if you looked at the peer-reviewed independent studies, and I think it was about 17 studies there available, three quarters answered the same question with a clear, yes, glyphosate does damage DNA, which by the way, was also the conclusion of the IARC. Or even more grotesque, how can it be that long-term carcinogenicity studies with rodents, which were taken by the IARC and later also by the US courts, as clear evidence for the carcinogenicity of glyphosate in laboratory animals. How can it be that these studies are taken by the European authorities as evidence to the contrary? It is to be expected that subsequent presentations uh, will shed light on these two questions, and I look very much forward to that. But there is a third question that can probably only be answered by the European authorities or the glyphosate manufacturers themselves. It's why after the controversy over glyphosate carcinogenicity with several lawsuits lost in the US, why did Bayer refrain from conducting a new cancer study? Such a study, if transparent and credibly uh, performed, could have been very useful for Bayer in the US court cases and to restore confidence, trust in, the, in Europe, but only if it yielded negative results. But if a manufacturer believes that a new properly conducted study would possibly not lead to negative results, it might prefer to resubmit the old studies and hope that the European authorities will not contradict their previous assessment. 
resubmitting its old studies was exactly what Bayer did. And yesterday's decision of ECA suggests Bayer could get away with that. Unfortunately, such a failure by the authorities undermines all the progress that has been made on pesticides at the political level in recent years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helmut. We're now going to Dr. Christopher Porchi, who is the former Associate Director of National Tox Toxicology Program in the US, is an expert in the design, analysis, and interpretation of environmental health data, and has also acted as the plaintiff's expert in the US litigations on glyphosate. Please, Dr. Porchi, you have the floor. Thank you. If I could have the slides. There we go, first yes. slide. There we are. Thank you very much. Um, I was asked to talk about the questions in the title right here. How can the same studies prove the carcinogenicity of glyphosate for some organizations like IARC in the US courts and its harmlessness for others like ECA and the US EPA? Next slide, please. I'm gonna move pretty quickly because I have a lot of material to go through. So. A risk assessment, an evaluation of the potential for hazard and risk or exposure to a chemical is a process. It's a process that is attempting to take science and interpret it in such a way that it can be used for policy decisions. It doesn't exist in isolation all by itself, and it has a history. And that history is encoded in guidance documents that tell you how to go about doing that type of process. Those guidance documents exist. Virtually every agency in the world has this. Um, and they all stem from a common history, mostly a paper done by Bradford Hill in 1965, dealing with how to evan evaluate human evidence of harm from chemicals in the environment. Um, next slide, please. There are four basic reasons why the outcomes are different in these various areas. Um, they have to do with what is your strategy for assessment? What are the guidelines and do you follow them? Do you have the correct understanding of the science? And who sets the tone of the assessment? Next slide, please. A strategy for assessing the, the available scientific evidence has four main points. First of all, there has to be a plan. The plan has to define what you're going to do, which data you're going to use, how you're going to approach them, how you're going to collect it, and how you're going to evaluate it. You then have to conduct that assessment. And there's ways of doing that that keep it transparent and useful to people to see. You want to verify that you followed the process uh, you did so that you're aligning with your plan and your guiding principles. And then you have to document any deviations from the original plan. That's what a strategy looks like. Next slide, please. In the courts of law in the United States, and in fact, several places around the world, um, the strategy has to be given in advance. You give a detailed analysis plan and guidance in a document provided before you step into court. So you don't just walk into court and give evidence. In the United States, in many of the cases, there's a judge who looks at what you did you give the judge a presentation and he decides if you're an expert or not before he allows it to go into a court case. In IARC, all aspects of this strategy are presented in their preamble, which is their guidance document. In the regulatory agencies, many of the guidelines cover most of these strategy issues. Next slide, please. There are some things that are not covered in many of these strategies that can lead to differences between the various groups in what they're doing. Um, first of all, it's a question of systemic review. Do you review everything or you review selective things? Um, do you reanalyze data or you use the analysis that's given to you by the researchers and by the industry? Um, do, you, do you exclude or include data and which data do you include or exclude? And finally, how, what do, you, how do you deal with deviations from your strategy? Next slide, please. Okay, so the biggest difference is the selective use of guidelines. Um, that, is, that makes the biggest difference in how these evaluations 
have happened. And there are at least eight different things that are selectively chosen by one group that isn't chosen by the other group that lead to the differences you're seeing. I'm going to present one of them because that's all the time I have. I'm going to look at what's called the use of historical controls. Historical controls come from doing these experiments. When I do an experiment, I always have a group of animals that doesn't get exposed to the chemical that I'm looking at. That way I can compare the exposed groups to the control animal. If I do 20 studies like this or 30 studies like this, I have 20 or 30 sets of controls. This tells me something about how these animals get tumors when they're not exposed to the chemical, and I can use that in evaluating the chemical. But there are guidelines for how to use that evidence in evaluating the chemical. Now, EPA, EFSA, and ECHA all repeatedly excluded positive findings against the concurrent controls due to the historical controls. This is just an example of a quote from the recent um, draft RAR that was done by EFSA and ECHA dealing with the malignant lymphomas in the CD, male CD1 mice. Now, this is an important tumor because these malignant lymphomas are basically the same B-type lymphoma that you have in NHL in humans. So discarding it makes a big difference. Next slide, please. So what do the guidelines say? The OEC guidelines that have to be followed by EFSA, ECHA, and others say that the control group is always the most important group. So here you've got four studies in male mice, three of which show an increase in risk of malignant lymphomas against the concurrent controls, and they're discarding those positive findings because of the historical controls. So they're violating their own guidelines. What do IARC's guidelines say? IARC guidelines are very clear. It is not appropriate to discount a tumor response that is significantly increased compared with concurrent controls by arguing that it falls within the range of historical controls. They're very, very clear on that issue. This did not happen in the IARC review of glyphosate, and hence they did not discard these findings. Finally, what does the US EPA say? Statistically significant increase in tumors should not be discounted simply because their incidence rates in the treaty groups are within the range of historical controls. So EPA has guidelines. In the court of law, there's nothing that a jury hates more than to find out that an agency had rules in place to do something and they didn't follow their own rules. And that's part of the reason why they're losing across the board in the US in these cases. It's not like these agencies don't know. It's not like they've been to not been told. These are my comments on the draft RAR. I had an entire section dealing with historical controls, the guidelines, and why this is not acceptable, even bolded all of these publications in the IARC reject the use of this range of historical controls as a proper method for evaluating a cancer bioassay. They ignore the advice and they will not change their findings. Got two minutes left. I think I'll make it. Um, insufficient understanding of the science. Some of the basic, there's a lot of areas here that I could touch on, but some of the basics are here. Um, most of these reviews are done by toxicologists who don't have a lot of training in epidemiology. They mistake what's potential bias in an epidemiology study for real bias. So even though the epi study says there's a possibility there's bias here, they can't show it and they try to avoid it as best they could. Um, but the regulatory agents say, well, there's potential bias, so it's real bias, so we're not going to use that information. They fail to understand how models adjust for co-founders and what this means, confounders, um, and they misinterpret the findings and, again, throw out positive findings because they're not adjusted the way they'd like to see them adjusted. And finally, they have overly simplistic views of the different types of studies that are used in epidemiology. They feel that uh, cohort studies are always better than case control studies, and this is just not true. They have to look at these studies very carefully. In toxicology, they have a lot of rules of thumb that are just plain wrong. They exclude results if they're if they're seen if they're not seen across different species or strains or sex. 
they have a complete failure to understand statistics and what it means in some of these evaluations. Um, and they've done subjective evaluations across studies, even when they've been shown how to do them objectively. Finally, whoever writes the first draft sets the tone. In the case of courts of law, the scientists who are defending their position in the court write everything, and they have to sign a, a, something to the effect that they have written everything. In IARC, the working group, the scientists themselves, write the original draft in the entire document. For EFSA and ECA, industry writes the first document, and they set the tone. And from there, it's all downhill. And finally, for EPA, it's a mix of EPA scientists and industry scientists. Finally, I'll end with this slide. You can read it while I say just a few more things. I believe that glyphosate is a class 1B carcinogen by European standards using the ECA evaluation procedures. And had it been followed correctly, that's where it would be. And finally, there's a report coming out next week that examines the arguments from the cancer studies um, that you, you get a chance to look at in more detail. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pochier. Uh, we now go to Professor Sigrid Knasmuller, genetic toxicologist at the Institute of Cancer Research at the Medical University of Vienna. Also 10 minutes for you, please have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, can I have the first slide, please? Here we are. Now, let me just uh, briefly introduce myself. I'm uh, leading a group here at the uh, Cancer Center in Vienna of the Medical University, which is uh, working on genetic toxicology. And so I'm not talking about carcinogenic properties of uh, glyphosate, but about mutagenic uh, properties of glyphosate. Can I have the next slide, please? Chemicals are tested in regard to their mutagenic properties because they cause adverse effects in humans. Practically all chemicals which cause damage of the genetic material cause cancer. But if germ cells are affected, they can also cause heritable diseases or infertility. And they can also cause other adverse effects in humans like accelerated aging. Not every chemical can be tested in regard to its carcinogenic properties because there is just too many chemicals around. Therefore, uh, chemicals are tested in relatively cheap mutagenicity tests uh, if they cause damage of the DNA and later on in carcinogenicity tests. But the question, if a compound causes mutations, is very crucial to predict its carcinogenicity. As I said, mutagens are carcinogens. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, if you have a chemical compound, it can cause primary damage of the DNA, adducts can form or the DNA can break. This can be either repaired or the cells die or the firm can or they uh, uh, lead to uh, heritable mutations which are passed from one cell to the other. Now, one test which detects DNA damage is the so-called single-cell gel electrophoresis assay where you measure DNA migration in an electric field. Now, this so-called comet assay reflects DNA damage. It may be repaired or it may cause mutations on the chromosomal level. And some of these uh, levels on the chromosomal level are chromosome aberrations or so-called micronuclei. This is a little chromosome fragment outside of the nucleus. It is indicative for a chromosome mutation. Next slide, please. Okay, now chemicals are tested like in carcinogenicity tests, we have strict guidelines which, uh, which should be followed. And these guidelines for Europe uh, are the so-called OECD guidelines. And it's not only one type of tests, but several tests that are performed in vitro with cell lines and bacteria. And 
more weight is usually given to the results of animal experiments because we think animals are more reliable as individual cells. And in these animals, we have multiple test systems. Mostly done is comet assay. It's a newer method which allows us to look into different organs, up to 15 different organs. And a much older test system is the so-called micronucleus assay, which is normally performed with bone marrow uh, cells uh, in the bones, or chromosomal aberration assays with the bone marrow. These are very traditional experiments which are performed to find out if a compound causes DNA damage. Now, we know that many carcinogens that cause DNA damage are also active at very low doses. That means if carcinogens cause damage of the, of the genetic materials, we think they are very dangerous for humans because very low doses are even doing an effect and, and harmful. The typical example is radioactive radiation, which is causing also at very, very low doses DNA damage and cancer. Okay, next slide, please. Now the question is, is glyphosate mutagenic or not? That's a very important question because when it's mutagenic, it's very, very likely that it's carcinogenic. And if it's not mutagenic, then we can think maybe it's harmless. There is non-mutagenic carcinogens like hormones and certain compounds, but they have threshold. They are less dangerous than the genotoxic mutagenic carcinogens. There is a controversy, like in cancer, there is also the controversy between concerning the mutagenicity, ECHA and EFSA say it's not uh, mutagenic. This was also confirmed recently by, by ECHA, whereas IAC has strong evidence for genotoxicity. IARC is using for this evaluation published studies in scientific journals. The decision of ECHA and EFSA is more or less entirely based on uh, studies uh, which are contract studies from the industry performed by toxicological laboratories. Usually these studies are not open for the public. Next slide, please. However, in 2019, the High Court in, in Europe said we uh, uh, also scientists can get open access to these industrial studies. And this, as I said, these industrial studies is around 60 studies uh, and uh, 40 of them were uh, assessed by different agencies. PFR initially 2015 said most of these studies are acceptable. But when we looked at the same studies from the industry, we found that many of them are not acceptable. And I, I consider myself an expert in this field because I'm also not only working since more than 30 years in this area, I'm also editor of chief of in mutation research, which is also a, a, a leading journal in this area. Now, later on in a later uh, uh, assessment, um, uh, the HEG said after our criticism, in Vienna said, okay, some of the study are not acceptable. So also uh, PASF said in a recent statement that they say the older studies are not so good. Okay, now uh, let us have a closer look at these studies, which are the basis for the decisions of the health authorities. Next slide, please. Many of the studies are not reliable because many, they are not in agreement with the OECD guidelines. Sometimes positive controls are missing. Sometimes the number of evaluated cells is not sufficient. Sometimes the background effects in the untreated cells are not, high, uh, are not uh, in agreement with the regulations and so on. So many of the studies are not okay. Next slide, please. Now, the Nevertheless, there is enough uh, evidence that the compound is negative in bone marrow and chromosomal aberration studies in bone marrow and negative in salmonella. But these tests are more than 30 years old and they are not reliable at all. The sensitivity is very low. They detect only five 
to four out of 10 genotoxic uh, uh, carcinogens. So these very old test systems are not very reliable. Next point, please. Next slide, please. In the published literature, you find at least four publications indicating that glyphosate is doing DNA damage in liver cells, indicative that the compound is not active in the bone marrow, but in the liver. Next slide, please. Now, this is in complete agreement with the experiments which I did in my laboratory, negative in the bone marrow, negative in salmonella, but positive in the liver in the comet assay. Next slide, please. Now, the position of the EFSA and EXA, EFSA, EXA and EFSA is the comet assay, which we, is based on the quantification of DNA migration in an electric field, may be repaired these comets. They may not give rise to mutations. That's what they say. Therefore, the negative results are irrelevant. That's what they say. Now, this is probably not true. Next slide, please. Because the comet assay detects carcinogens, which are genotoxic, much better, almost 80%, than the other tests on which the decision of EFSA and ECHA is based. And there is a new test, which uh, was established for as an OECD guideline in 2014. So there is a very well-validated test system which detects gene mutations in many different organs in the liver. These tests should be performed. And it's completely unclear why ECHA and EFSA don't ask for such experiments because everything is pointing into the direction of uh, effect in the liver. And we found also effects in the testes. We also found effects in the stomach, not in the bone marrow. Next slide, please. And uh, that uh, is the current situation. We have reliable tests, uh, which indicate that there is something going on in other organs, not in the bone marrow. Next slide, please. And therefore, in my opinion, there's a very urgent need to conduct these studies. And in my opinion, also the comet assays, which are uh, available already, point very clear into the direction. And this is the reason why the classification as non-mutagenic is not justified on the basis of the currently available data. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Knasmüller. Uh, we now go on to Dr. Kurt Streif, physician and epidemiologist, um, former head of the IARC Monographs Program, so the International Agency for Research on Cancer that we've already been hearing about. Uh, and currently Associated Research Professor at IS Global in Barcelona. Please. Okay, thank you for your introduction. Uh, you kind of uh, nicely merged my two affiliations. I'm a research professor at Boston College in the US, where I'm currently giving this presentation, and I'm a research IS associate at IS Global Barcelona, Spain. Uh, thanks to the presentations from the previous speakers, my job is now even easier. Um, Chris uh, Portier has uh, nicely uh, shown how important transparency is and that you need guidelines and that these need to be published in advance for the IR monographs program at the time of the evaluation of glyphosate as probably carcinogenic to humans. This was the IR monographs preamble that was amended and updated in 2006. Uh, these guidelines include procedural guidelines uh, regarding participant selection, conflict of interest management, stakeholder involvement, and meeting contact. Then there's a layer of uh, criteria for the review of the scientific studies by cancer in humans, cancer in experimental animals, and all the mechanistic evidence in the other data. And then from there, there's a clear decision process for evidence integration across the different streams that is then leading to the overall evaluation. So for glyphosate, let's start with the cancer in humans. Uh, the conclusion of the working group in volume 112 was limited evidence for non-Hodgkin lymphoma according to the IARC definition of limited, which indeed means that there is credible uh, evidence for a causal association. 
However, uh, chance bias and confounding cannot be ruled out with reasonable confidence. This evaluation was based on several case control studies, a big cohort study from the US, and also a meta-analysis combining all of these studies. Uh, the case control studies had more than 2,500 cases, and the cohort study had uh, less than 100 cases. Uh, this contributes to their weight in the meta-analysis and their weight in the overall evidence kind of integration. Um, so this is the limited in humans at the volume 112 meeting. Then we come to the cancer in uh, experimental animals, in fact, in mice, fat glyphosate. At the time, there were two positive results in two feeding studies. And these were based on rare cancers, and these are extremely important in assessing human risk. But also at the same time, they're challenging to detect signals from background noise. Uh, therefore, you need to bring in, uh, in a clearly well-defined way, historical controls. Uh, and they had high statistical significance, and the evaluation was fully in line with accepted principles as laid out by the IR monographs preamble. So from there, from the cancer and experimental animals, a causal relationship was established, leading to sufficient evidence of cancer in experimental animals. These were the data that uh, Dr. Portier talked about. Now we have the data on uh, genotoxicity. And as Professor Knassmüller already summarized, the, the conclusion there was that there was strong evidence uh, for glyphosate formulations in exposed uh, community residents and in other uh, experiments. But there was also strong evidence for glyphosate, the pure glyphosate. Of course, there were, for this one, no studies in exposed humans because it's always used in formulations and experimenting with it would be considered unethical. So taking together these three lines of evidence, as briefly summarized, there was the overall evaluation following the uh, published IR uh, preamble uh, that uh, glyphosate is probably carcinogenic to humans, group 2A, and that was based on the sufficient evidence for cancer in animals and the limited evidence in humans, specifically for the association with non-Hodgkin lymphoma, but would also in addition have been supported by the strong evidence for DNA damage. And uh, importantly, and there is sometimes deliberate mixing up and confusion out there, this evidence was for glyphosate in the cancer and experimental animals and also for glyphosate in the mechanistic data. So if you would take these two together, uh, following the IR monographs preamble, you would also lead to 2A, so clear evidence in animals and also clear evidence from the mechanistic data. I had this as a big background, and now very briefly, I go into what has happened since the uh, last IARC evaluation of uh, glyphosate. There are several new epidemiological studies, and including a, a big um, cohort consortium analysis from the APRICO consortium, in fact, that's a consortium that I had reinitiated together with Aaron Blair at uh, IARC. And uh, this is really looking into agricultural health studies. And uh, this was about pesticide use and risk of non Hodgkin uh, lymphomas in these agricultural cohorts using three of the cohorts that had usable data for this analysis showed an increase of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, certain non-Hodgkin lymphomas for uh, the exposure to glyphosate. Um, this is not a systematic review of all the studies published since, but um, Professor Zhang uh, from UC Berkeley uh, did such a, a meta-analysis combining all of the available studies. And uh, in her meta-analysis with her team, she also concluded that there is clear evidence of an increased risk of uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. She later published another uh, issue following some of the ongoing debate, which was called Weeding Out Inaccurate Information on Glyphosate-Based Herbicides and Risk of Non-Hodgkin Lymphoma. And just this year at the big triannual meeting of ICO in Australia and online, she presented an update uh, clearly concluding that glyphosate uh, causes uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. This is about the update on cancer in humans. I think we have already heard everything in all kind of uh, necessary detail 
uh, from uh, Dr. Portier regarding the cancer in experimental animals. Let me just briefly mention that this is uh, our original kind of uh, copies from the IARC monograph that indeed the working group looked at the review that was published by Crime and colleagues uh, together with the industry stakeholders uh, just the weekend before the final monograph meeting after the one year long process uh, con uh, was convened and came up with their final evaluations. And the working group looked at these in all detail, but the working group concluded, these are the famous square brackets on the working group evaluations of published literature, that the working group was unable to evaluate this review, this study, because of the limited experimental data provided in the review article and the big uh, chunk of supplemental information. So this is not that a court, what Monsanto said, cherry picking of data, the data were looked at and were deemed not useful. So when, as uh, 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 Mr. Butcher uh, laid nicely out uh, the whole process and successes following the glyphosate case, uh, some of these uh, uh, cancer biases have been made publicly available. And then uh, Dr. Portier did a comprehensive analysis of the animal carcinogenicity data for glyphosate from chronic exposure rodent carcinogenicity studies. And I don't need to go into the details Essentially, uh, the evidence has just become much stronger after taking into account the full uh, information from these cancer bioassays. Let's now come to the third stream of evidence, uh, focusing here on damaging to DNA uh, and uh, genotoxicity. Uh, there was an earlier publication by uh, Dr. Charles Benbrock, formerly with uh, EPA, now retired. He uh, concluded in his research paper, how did the US EPA and IR reach diametrically opposed uh, conclusions on the genotoxicity that EPA uh, relied mostly on registered commissioned unpublished regulatory studies, 99% of which were negative while well, IARC relied mostly on peer-reviewed studies of which 70% were positive. And this has been further undermined by Professor Knaas Müller, who concluded that the industry studies, which were kept secret uh, until recently, um, would not refute the IARC classification because of methodological issues. This is the science update. As Dr. Portier pointed out, we also need to think about guidelines and indeed, uh, I let the update, the latest update of the monographs preamble that was in 2018. And the new preamble really corroborates all of the kind of strengths of the preamble, has some additional updates in terms of systematic review methodology, introducing the key characteristics, which have in fact already been explored at the glyphosate meeting and uh, has a few other um, kind of new dimensions, refined the evaluation criteria for mechanistic evidence and uh, the integration of the evidence streams. Bottom line, essentially, uh, there are no significant changes that would change any of the evaluation that came out of the volume 112 if we would apply the same evidence with the same working group to the new IR monographs preamble. So again, not only the science, also the procedures would uh, reconfirm the IR monographs evaluation. And in concluding, this is my last slide, every five years, the IR monographs program convenes an advisory group that looks into all the public nominations for re-evaluations in, in future monographs. And this report of the advisory group was also published in 2019. That was in April or May 2019. And glyphosate was one of the agents that was nominated for re-evaluation. And this advisory group, this is not a monographs working group, this is an advisory group that advises IR what to look into in future monographs in the five-year program. They concluded that all the evidence published since the IR monographs volume um, and the evidence on cancer in humans uh, appears to remain limited. This is a difficult call. Uh, and uh, in addition, no changes anticipated in the conclusions regarding cancer and experimental animals or the mechanistic evidence. Therefore, a re-evaluation would not be warranted within the next five years. 
recommendation is no evaluation in the next five years, which is the lowest level. And with this, I think the overall summary is the IR monographs evaluation of glyphosate as probably carcinogenic to humans based on all the three streams together has only become stronger and still stands. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Strife. Uh, we now go to our final speaker, Professor Violet Geisen, agronomist at the Wageningen University at the Department of Environmental Sciences. Please, you have the floor. Yeah, thanks for the invitation for this uh, presentation. Um, I will share my screen. Since I am coming from an environmental view, I would like to show you uh, where is glyphosate? and who is exposed to glyphosate. And I will talk about the environmental presence and the overall health uh, impact. Um, just let me see why I can't. So, okay, glyphosate is the most applied uh, herbicide in Europe. Per year, more than 47,000 tons are applied per year. And it's very important, especially for industry, because 33% of all herbicides sold is glyphosate. And just to remember you, glyphosate was introduced into the market in 1974. So uh, glyphosate is present in the ecosystem. And let me see where it is. It is applied to the soils, as you can see here. And then it is transported to the water bodies, to the sediment in the surface water, and to the dust that we inhalate as humans. You can see that in organic farms, we don't found any uh, glyphosate in the soils. We were studying the content in 10 case study sites across whole Europe. In, our, in conventional farms, we found about nearly 20% of the soils containing glyphosate in different concentrations. The surface water body, independently whether they were connected to organic or conventional fields, they contained, 70% of them contained glyphosate. Sediment more or less the same in the organic farms. Uh, near to organic farm sediment was less contaminated. The dust contained 100%. All, all of the dust samples we were taking in the 10 case study sites across Europe contained glyphosate in different concentrations. We also had a look at AMPA, the first uh, stable metabolite of glyphosate, and we can see here that 30%, 35% of the soils contained AMPA, even in organic farms. We, could, uh, we found this. It was detected in more than 30% of the water, surface water bodies, in the sediment, and in 90% of the dust. What does it mean for ecosystem and humans? Ecosystem, that means the aquatic ecosystem, fish, are exposed living in the water bodies and in the sediment. Humans are exposed to dust. Flying insects are exposed to dust. And the soil is the base for food production is as well exposed and the, all the organisms living in the soil are exposed to glyphosate and AMPA. We as well checked the presence in human urine in the case study sites, in these 10 case study sites across Europe. We analyzed what is in the, in the urine of conventional and organic farmers and in conventional and organic consumers meaning people who eat organic. We detected glyphosate in 45% of conventional farmers and AMPA in nearly 30% of conventional farmers. Organic farmers who never applied glyphosate in the last five years, even though we found here 30% of the uh, urine samples being positive, 20% uh, contained AMPA. For the conventional consumers, uh, 20, more than 20% glyphosate, 30% AMPA. And organic consumers contain the same um, amount of glyphosate in their blood, in their urine, sorry, 
and AMPA was less. In the blood, we could not detect AMPA or glyphosate due to a high detection limit. What does it mean? There are no benchmarks for concentrations of the effects of glyphosate in soil, sediment, dust, blood, urine, and feces. There are only benchmarks of so-called maximum residue levels for food and benchmarks for surface water. What does it mean? We do not know the concentrations we have detected in these environmental compartments. What is the effect on ecosystem health? We do not know either what are the concentrations we have detected in human urine and we are still uh, analyzing feces, we don't have still the results. What does it mean for human health? And as you can see here, the input uh, for humans is via food, via air, and via the water. So what is the risk for humans uh, and, uh, if we sum up this input waste? And what is the effect on environmental health? And I just had a look at the ecotoxicity data and the toxic human health data. We're based on the PBDB database and EFSA conclusions. What I saw here is uh, that the ecotoxic quality toxicity is uh, classified as moderately alert. That means there's a moderate chronic ecotoxicity for birds for fish and for earthworms. Human health, as I could find, but you are the experts, <laughs> we find moderately alert, potentially cancerogenous, potentially endocrine disruptors, potential uh, uh, reproduction development effects. But it depends which indicators you are using. What we know is when we are looking on resilience, and I think we all get aware how important resilience was in the corona epidemic in the last two years. Who got ill, who did not get ill, who was affected by pathogens and who not. We can transfer this concept to soils. If soils are resilient, if soils are healthy, if soils have an intact microbiome, pathogens will not affect plants so fast and they help the plants to grow in a healthy environment. The same is for bees and the gut microbiome in bees is very important for their resistance and resilience. The same for fish gut microbiome. And what about humans? There are incidences that alteration in gut microbiome as well decrease the resilience. But what does it all have to do with, with glyphosate? Here the example for soils, I already gave this in the European Parliament some years ago. In the soils, the base for food production, we have the rhizosphere, which is the root zone of the plants. And in this root zone, we have the good ones, the beneficial bacteria and fungi, which support the plant on growing. And we have the bad ones. These are the ones which are pathogens and cause diseases from plants. And we have the the ugly ones, they're called, which come from contaminated food or waste. Unfortunately, glyphosate kills because it is uh, um, killing all organisms, having the shikimate pathway one. It kills most of the beneficial uh, bacteria and fungi in the soil. But the pathogens, a lot of the pathogens, like Fusarium and Rhizotonia, who affect plant diseases, are resistant because they have shikimate pathway too. What means? What does it mean? We talk with farmers and they tell us if we apply glyphosate over many years, we have more and more problems with pathogens, especially fungi, and we have to apply more and more fungicides in the soils to get rid of these fungi. So that means the resilience of soil health decreases. But these parameters are not taken into consideration for glyphosate approval or not approval. They are not tested. They are no, there is no official EFSA data on it. Um, 
but it is evident and there is a review coming out from for in 2021 which exactly explains the effects of glyphosate on resilience which is a very important issue and if we look for human health as well there is an uh, evidence we know that this the role of the gut microbiome is very important for human resistance resilience and as well, it is described in a very interesting review article how glyphosate as well in the human gut reduces lactobacillus bifilegrium, these bacteria which are important for the resistance, resilience, and um, all uh, other bacteria take over in the gut which do not have the shikimate pathway 1 but shikimate pathway 2. And so this as well leads to an inequilibrium to the gut microbiome. Unfortunately, there are no data on this because this is not an indicator which has to be tested by EFSA. And there is no maximum tolerable value for this, maximum level. It does not exist. We just ignore this fact that the indirect health effects of glyphosate to ecosystem health and human health are not at all considered. And another effect. The farm to fork strategy is trying to reduce 50% of pesticide use at risk. If glyphosate is not approved anymore, we will have in Europe 20% reduction of pesticide use in total. That about the quantity. And now what I would like to end with something. We have a threat. There is a narrative of a threat. If there are no pesticides applied anymore, yields will go down by 10 to 20 percent. This is taken under consideration if the pesticides are reduced by 50 percent. But if you reduce maybe 12 percent for bit glyphosate, you can think maybe yields are going down by 10 percent. And food prices increase. This is a threat. And this is a story about. But what is the solution? The agriculture we are now working in was developed after the hunger winter after the World War in 1945 and in the 50s. Never again hunger. We need something to avoid this. Now we are still using this, the same concept, spraying glyphosate in the whole fields to kill weeds. This is a concept which is very, very old. But now we are flying to the Mars and to the Moon and wherever, and we still use this concept in agriculture. It's time for a modern agroecological production. We could call it Agriculture 2030. At the same time, reducing food waste, which is now about 30%, and we could as well add increasing meat consumption. We are there, we have the solution. We can work in an agroecological system, increasing ecosystem health, resilience, and strongly reducing human exposure. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Violet Geisen. Um, thank you very much for these uh, broad conclusions and also for taking us uh, to the, to the current debates on, on the farm to fork uh, strategy as well as glyphosate. That is really fantastic. Uh, thank you very much every, for every speaker. Um, so we have heard uh, an incredible amount of information on the reasons why uh, diff the, the carcinogenity studies on glyphosate were interpreted in a different way by, uh, by different institutions, uh, why the EU relies so much or that the fact that the EU relies so much on industry studies uh, while they are actually uh, not reliable uh, and, the, and the difference with the IARC uh, opinion uh, that is large that is reliant on peer-reviewed published studies which are discarded by the EU agencies uh, and that um, the IARC opinion according to the, the new um, advisory council is still standing and doesn't need to be revised uh, and finally, that glyphosate is everywhere in the environment, as well as AMPA, uh, with unknown effects on human health 
uh, and impacts on the ecosystems, while actually by reducing pesticides, we would be avoiding uh, a lot of problems. So we, now we turn to uh, our members of European Parliament for a first reaction uh, after hearing all of that. Uh, and after having, having made all these recommendations uh, a few years ago in the EP Pest Committee. Um, so I would like to first go to uh, Ms. Guteland, if she is uh, available. Are you there? For first, like four, uh, very short, four minute re reaction and question. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for um, giving me this opportunity to listen and to ask questions. I must say that it has been um, very informative to listen to uh, the presentations and the studies and how the scientific work is being done and uh, also the the difficulties uh, and uncertainties, but uh, my main uh, uh, impression from listening today has been that we have also uh, very much uh, a situation where, where we should be using the precautionary principle uh, when it comes to glyphosate because uh, what's been said here today I I think the overall message to me as a politician is that uh, we need to be very careful and uh, that um, we have uh, studies that is providing us um, knowledge that should be taken into account that uh, human bodies are affected and also that um, uh, we have been relying in the EU institutions on also very much industry reports uh, and, and studies that have taken into account uh, uh, not, not being very uh, non-biased uh, in a sense. And I think that is also very important. Uh, I, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a member in the European Parliament in the Environmental Committee, and I have also been in the in the pest committee who was investigating um, also um, uh, the situation around glyphosate and uh, the Monsanto papers. Uh, so I was in that committee and I also was uh, involved in the decisions that the parliament took last legislature on uh, actually saying that glyphosate should be phased out this year. and. Um, uh, affecting also uh, the Commission and uh, how the Commission reasoned on this. Uh, the Parliament has has been more careful. But if I could ask a question to the panelists, uh, and uh, it is difficult to choose. Uh, I think uh, all of you have, um, have presented important uh, knowledge here. Uh, but uh, I would like to uh, ask uh, the uh, the panelists, how you think, uh, uh, um, how you think that European Parliament should act at this uh, moment, and where it would be uh, of most importance uh, for us to react, and how? I know this is really difficult uh, since it's not your role, but I think we need the bridge between the. Uh, what what we are doing and uh, what's uh, been said here today. So I, I would like to hear um, if um, what you see uh, that the Parliament as an actor uh, could contribute with, uh, uh, because we have decided that we would like to uh, phase out the glyphosate, and uh, that is a strong message from the European Parliament. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, and we are here today and uh, we are not there. Uh, so what should be our next uh, step? How should okay. we uh, try to move this forward? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll now give the floor to uh, Michel Rivasi uh, of the Greens. And uh, please all be short because I'm just watching the time. We have until 5.30. So please go ahead. Just a few minutes. Oui. Eh bien, euh, D'abord, merci aux panélistes. Parce que vos interventions, elles étaient très intéressantes pour montrer que, en tant que député, vous savez qu'on est dans, quand même dans une situation terrible. 
On a des scientifiques, que ce soit M. Porcher, que ce soit M. Euh, Christophe Portier, que ce soit Siegfried, Krasmuller, Kurt Streif, qui montrent que, d'une part, les études euh, fournies par les industriels euh, ne sont pas forcément toutes conformes aux bonnes pratiques de laboratoire et qu'ils évitent de prendre les nouvelles études. Et alors, ce qui nous a... Alors, juste pour information, on était intervenu lors du renouvellement en 2015 euh, pour... On avait saisi la Cour de justice européenne et grâce à cinq députés verts, on a pu obtenir de la Cour de justice européenne le fait d'avoir accès aux études. Vous voyez, maintenant, si vous avez accès aux études des industriels, c'est grâce au travail des membres du Parlement euh, qui ont dû saisir donc, la Cour de justice européenne pour que, en raison euh, d'une question de santé publique majeure, parce que ça touchait l'environnement et la santé, maintenant on ne peut plus avoir secret d'affaires. Bon. Mais aujourd'hui ou hier, on a découvert que les cas disaient que le glyphosate n'était pas cancérogène. Donc on se retrouve dans la même situation grosso modo qu'en 2015. Alors, qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire Je rejoins ma copine, ma collègue Utland. Qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire, nous, en tant que députés On a de nouvelles études qui ne sont pas prises en compte. Euh, Vous-même vous dites que c'est génotoxique, que ça peut être un perturbateur endocrinien, et pourtant, il va y avoir un lobbying très fort au niveau des États membres que ce soit le lobbying de Bayer maintenant et Monsanto, que ce soit le lobbying des syndicats agricoles pour continuer à utiliser le glyphosate. Et ce n'est pas seulement le glyphosate en tant que substance active, c'est aussi tous les produits avec les coformulants, avec les synergistes, etc., qui font que le produit peut être encore mille fois plus toxique que la substance active elle-même. Alors, Qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire pour justement faire évoluer les choses et qu'on arrête l'utilisation des produits contenant du glyphosate Merci. Merci, Michel. Uh, I'd like to go to um, Thomas Weitz for an even shorter question, because otherwise we won't have time to go back to, uh, to our scientists and uh, then we go to Anja Haaskamp. Please go ahead, Thomas. Thank you. I can be very short and concise. Uh, first of all, thank you for giving us all these detailed arguments on a scientific level to counter uh, other sci scientific uh, levels uh, in, in all this discussion. That's very, very helpful. Um, yes, the question was, why do, did they not commission a new cancerogenic study uh, for the new application? Well, because we implemented a rule that all the studies have to be registered and you can't withdraw them just because you don't like the result, because this was a problem earlier. The industry was commissioning studies and the ones that they didn't like they just didn't bring into the uh, into the process so that's one of the of the um, answers um, uh, the commission also promised to have an own data review not only by the results I think this has not been fulfilled this promise uh, and then last but not least um, thanks for uh, working on the metabolites uh, so much and giving us all these insights especially that you need an increase of fungicides if you have glyphosate applied on the fields that's a very interesting information unfortunately by leaving glyphosate away this would not reduce the, the use of overall pesticides because it would be mostly replaced by other herbicides. Uh, but what, and it's not also not linked to the uh, reduction of yields. Uh, this is to fungicides and insecticides, which have a certain effect on the yield, not the glyphosate, because not using herbicides would be re replaced by mechanical weeding, and that has fairly no uh, effect on the overall yield. So this argument, uh, I don't buy anyway. Uh, and that's my main interventions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Anya, please come in. And then we'll give back the floor to, uh, to our panel. Yes, thank you, Nina. Uh, and uh, thank you all for organizing this uh, timely event. Uh, it is good that we are talking about glyphosate uh, again. Uh, many of us know each other from the pesticides committee uh, that dealt with glyphosate. Uh, and we argued in that committee for stricter uh, regulations, more safety guarantees, and more transparency. Um, and we were subs uh, subsequently uh, able to, to enshrine a number of these matters into legislation, into uh, uh, the general food law. 
Um, but um, the uh, more is needed uh, yet. And the glyphosate dossier is illustrative for the way we, the toxic multinationals literally hurt anyone who gets in their way and, and to make even more profit, uh, manipulating farmers, uh, research, and even nature and plants is their core business. And uh, the announced uh, postponement of the assessment mm -hmm. of glyphosate by EFSA is unfortunately the next uh, in a long list of very dangerous pesticides that um, remain on the European market without uh, proper assessment and, and thus without proof of safety. Um, together with fellow MEPs uh, from the S&D group and the Greens group, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, objected to these types of uh, automatic extensions uh, for dangerous pesticides such as uh, dimoxystrobin, flumioxazine, and, and so on. Uh, and we always get a big majority in the parliament uh, for this. And I can uh, assure you that when there is an extension or a renewal of the approval of glyphosate, we will do the same. Uh, we will get a majority in the parliament. But unfortunately, we have no right to veto this. Uh, uh, but it, So we have to use other instruments uh, uh, as well to get this poison uh, of our markets. Uh, I would like to thank the, 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 uh, um, the speakers for their interesting uh, presentations. I have a few questions. Uh, uh, do you think that enough is being done with the recommendations of the Pesticides Committee, uh, uh, in your opinion? And do you agree with me that a pesticide like glyphosate, uh, if it not was on the market, on the market, uh, been on the market for decades, but just a new active substance, would it be uh, authorized? Uh, what do you think? Would it ever get uh, authorized? And uh, finally, yesterday, uh, as Nina already mentioned, a very disappointing statement uh, was released by the European Union Chemicals Agency, uh, which proposes no change in the hazard classification of glyphosate. Uh, and this could lead to another approval of glyphosate for 50 more years. And I'm really concerned about this. Um, and I would like to ask our panelists, is the new opinion of uh, ECA's risk assessment committee in uh, which they conclude no change in hazard classification uh, scientifically sound in your opinion? Thank you. Thank you very much, Anja Hasekamp. So let's go back to our panel straight away. Uh, please, Professor Geisen, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I want you to ask, uh, to give an, an all-around answer. I'm not a politician, so I don't know very well how it works. But what I see as a citizen, that I would like the parliament to take a strong lead in asking the European Commission why the precautionary principle is not applied. That means if a car gets onto the European market, this car has to be 100% sure that it that it stops when I, I, I push the, the, the frame. Why is this principle not applied for the pesticide market? That would be my first question. It's up to you to solve this, but it's a political question. The second question I would have if I were in the parliament, I would ask myself, why are no benchmarks, no first as well as established in Europe? This was tried in 2007, I think, to get to the European Parliament with a soil thematic strategy, it was not approved in this time. Why it would be very important that we get benchmarks in Europe which so show how high can the concentrations be in dust, how high can they be in the environment, so how high can the sum of the human exposure be, and this should be regulated by legislation. And maybe this is a uh, something which the parliament could play a role in. And uh, the other thing is, um, I don't know how dependent the EFSA, the selection of EFSA indicators is from the European Parliament, but I hear from the glyphosate discussion is always sticking on the same issues. Is it cancerogenic or not? Yes, no, yes, no. So there the precautionary principle would be very important. But why do we not look at the real effects it has? <laughs> yeah? Why do we stick to the EFSA indicators, which are there, which are showing a reality, which is not a reality? And maybe there is where the parliament could make some pressure to get legislation on place, which is needed. Environmental legislation, 
and as well as the following benchmarks and uh, threshold values. Thanks very much, Professor Geisen. And I think the fact that EFSA has just decided to postpone the whole uh, their opinion by one year. Um, uh, it, it gives glyphosate a one-year free ride, but at the same time, there would be time to uh, go deeper into these uh, issues and, and to these uh, demands. Um, Dr. Poitier, you have your hand up. Would you like to respond to the questions, please? Yes, I would. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the PES Committee for the things they did get right and get it right very well. Um, no hidden studies, full disclosure on those studies, the study registry, all of those things will make a big difference. And keeping your eye on those things, to make sure they actually continue to happen, like the transparency in the studies, is something I think that you can uh, you can do for us. Um, uh, Representative Hazelkamp's question, if it were a new active substance submitted today, what would happen? Um, it would be it would be banned. It would be excluded from use in the, in the in the European Union, and it would there would be no doubt about it. What you've got is a legacy that people are unwilling to back away from, um, and I think that's a problem with not just um, glyphosate but across the board, and that's a management problem. And the next thing you should look at is how are these agencies managed, and what can we do to to get them more in line with what's needed under precaution, precautionary principles and what's needed under the science for what they're doing. I, I think it's time to look very carefully at the management structure. And one last thing, one thing that, that strikes me as coming from the United States into Europe and being involved in this in Europe um, after having spent so much time in the United States, I don't think conflict of interest by government employees in Europe is very well regulated. I think you have to look at that very carefully. I think there's some conflict of interest going on on some of these committees with some of these employees. And I think you should look at that very carefully and make sure your laws are strong enough to protect the people of Europe. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Poitier. Um, who would like to go next? Maybe Mr. Streif? Would you like to respond to some of the questions? Yeah, thank you for bringing me in again. I mean, we should not forget that the IROC evaluation was what I would say, an independent evaluation from independent experts who don't have any real or perceived conflicts of interest. That it was a purely scientific evaluation. And as I've tried to show today, it really stands uh, the test of time. Uh, from there, whatever else happened afterwards, I mean, even before it was officially out, Monsanto broke the embargo and saying cherry pick, uh, chunk science, etc. Everything else that happened afterwards was the civil society and the different stakeholders. And I think the civil society has reached a lot now that all of these theories are indeed made publicly available and that there is a great interest that they cannot just kind of uh, wave it through. And I think this is where, uh, in line with what uh, Dr. Portier said, you really point out why they come to false conclusions on specific studies, not following, in fact, their guidelines, not following the kind of internationally agreed guidelines on evaluation of these studies. That is the one part regarding the science, but then also uh, regarding the civil society and, and politicians, you, you need to keep that up and need to keep all the activities up and uh, make sure that the false science is not passed through the parliament. Thank you very much, Mr. Streif. Um, Mr. Knasmüller, would you like to react? Yes. Uh, well, as I pointed out uh, in my talk already, there is some evidence indicating that glyphosate causes damage of the genetic material, which is a key mechanism that causes cancer. That that's a, a very clear. There is very clear data which show that, and you just do not want to expose humans to such a compound. Uh, we Unfortunately, there is no human 
genotoxicity data because people in the agricultural fields are exposed to many different chemicals, not only to one. Uh, what we would need is maybe a study in a, in a production site of, of glyphosate, uh, which could give us a more clear answer in humans. So uh, you would not like to, uh, uh, to expose people to this compound because it's not sufficiently shown that it is safe. But on a more general level, I, I should like to, to state that uh, this is not only a problem we are not only talking about a problem that is associated with the use of glyphosate. We are also talking about a more general problem because the common practice is that producers uh, make contracts with, with toxicological companies. The compounds are tested and then health authorities are informed. But the information usually is not given to the public. It's also not given to scientists, uh, to independent scientists, but to health authorities. And there is no possibility to check if the quality of the studies is good or not. Uh, only in the case of glyphosate, it was an exception. I think it would be much more, uh, uh, would give me a much better feeling if the, when there is independent uh, governmental or European uh, uh, toxicological uh, uh, agencies which independently test chemicals and not uh, are not uh, uh, directly dependent on uh, toxicologic uh, on on producers. That, that's a very intransparent and questionable strategy. Thank you very much. Yeah, that reminds me of of the demands we made to EFSA in two thousand twelve uh, that the industry should pay into a publicly managed fund and that the, the studies should be carried out by independent uh, laboratories. Um, so yes, the, the demands have been, been made indeed for a long time, but it's still uh, not happening. Uh, we, we now have um, five and I hope if I look at the organizers, uh, maybe 10 more minutes for uh, questions that have been put by uh, participants. Uh, I'm taking a few ones. It's not possible to do to do them all. <laughs> yes, Michel. Yeah. Oui, euh, oui. Je voudrais dire aux scientifiques comment ils expliquent que l'ECA a pris connaissance des nouvelles études sur la cancérogénicité du glyphosate et pourquoi maintenant. Après cinq ans, ils disent que c'est toujours pas cancérogène. Comment vous l'expliquez en tant que scientifique Et puis l'EFSA et même les États membres, parce qu'il y a quatre pays rapporteurs, ils sont sur les mêmes conclusions qu'il y a cinq ans. Et c'est là nous, on a besoin de vous pour dire que ce soit Monsieur Portier, que ce soit Monsieur Strail et, et d'autres que c'est pas normal qu'ils qu ne prennent pas les études universitaires. C'est pas normal qu'ils prennent des études qui sont pas aux normes et des standards euh, via les études industrielles. Vous voyez la situation où on est On peut même pas appliquer le principe de précaution. On a nos agences qui sont référents sur le plan européen qui disent ce n'est pas cancérogène, ce n'est pas mutagène. Et il suffisait de montrer que c'était mutagène avec des cultures de cellules germinales pour bloquer le système, pour interdire le glyphosate. Tant qu'on n'a pas ce critère de mutagénicité, on ne peut pas le faire. Donc on est coincé, nous. On a beau... Moi, écoutez, il y a cinq ans, j'avais fait venir les avocats américains, j'avais fait venir des scientifiques américains pour montrer le scandale des Monsanto Papers. Et bien là, cinq ans après, on n'a pas évolué dans IOTA. Voilà, c'est pour ça que c'est un coup d'alarme que je vous donne, parce que je trouve que c'est scandaleux. On a eu la commission PEC avec mes collègues, on a montré les dysfonctionnements de nos agences. Cinq ans après, c'est la même chose. Voilà où on en est. Et c'est pour ça que ce webinaire, il est important, parce qu'on euh, a besoin d'être tous ensemble pour essayer de faire évoluer les choses. Thank you very much, uh, Michel. So, so she's asking the questions again, um, like how is it possible that we have again uh, um, 
an opinion by Echa yesterday based on all the uh, industry evidence and using this, uh, making basically the same mistakes as, as last time that, uh, that glyphosate is uh, mm. not carcinogenic. Um, would you like to respond, uh, Violette, and then Kurt? Yes, I would. I would, as well, yes. Yes, I would like to as well. Yeah, maybe we should have a look in another way to approach the whole problem. As you could see with tabac, the mind shift of people was the one which changed the behavior towards smoking. In the Netherlands, nobody nearly smokes anymore, not because it's forbidden, but because there was a mind shift. And people got aware that it's not healthy for them to do it. And sometimes I think we are now fighting and fighting against uh, all these rules and, and, and trying to, to convince them here and there and then we have contradictory information and whatever. If we would agree on the European Parliament would make it very strong to, to inform people, to make citizen awareness and as well farmer awareness about what is going on when they apply, and it's not only glyphosate, that is one example. We have in the market 500 other substances which are not better, yeah? <laughs> but if, if the people get aware what is going on, what they're inhalating, what they're eating, what is uh, getting legislation on, what is in food, yeah? So then, um, and make aware, people aware what is going on, Maybe there we could achieve a mind shift and not continuously trying to get a legislation or to let, let to follow the, the, the EFSA data, which are not testing all relevant indicators. So we are running always behind these rules. Maybe it's time for, for looking for a shift, for a mind shift. And maybe this could be a role of, as well of the parliament. Thank you, Professor Gijs. And before I give the, the floor to Dr. Portier, I would like to um, throw in one question from the Q&A. What about the formulations in which glyphosate is always used? Uh, if the scientific debate is already so complicated and controversial about just one molecule, what to think about the formulations? So um, maybe you could say something about that as well. Please, Mr. Portier. Um, the, the formulations are more toxic. That's, that's the simplest way to put it. Um, the evidence is quite clear. The magnitude of that difference differs from scientist to scientist, but most of the independent scientists who have looked at the data are talking about a two to 10 to even, in some cases, a hundred fold difference in the toxicity of the uh, mixture as compared to the individual compounds. Um, I, I share, um, uh, Ms. Ravasi's frustration. Um, I would love ideas as to what we can do as scientists to try to change this situation. I've offered to speak to ECA. I have offered to speak to EFSA. In the U.S. courts, in the first court case, I spoke to that jury for 48 hours, six solid days of eight hours a day, talking about the science for glyphosate. I have not been given more than 10 minutes to talk to any of the regulatory authorities about my concerns about the reviews of glyphosate. They, they will only take written comments. They will not take a face-to-face -face discussion. Thank you, Mr. Portier. Um, looking at the, at the time, we are, uh, we are at the end of the time. Um, maybe uh, to Professor Geisen, uh, you talked about um, a study of the uh, results of the EU-wide study on glyphosate in ecosystems. When uh, will this be published? And, um, and yeah, how can we um, put that forward to ECHA and ECHA um, to suggest new indicators that might, uh, based on your work? But we are doing this, this project is a European Commission paid project where we are uh, developing new indicators. I will present our ideas uh, in uh, EFSA in, in Brussels in June, uh, this uh, next month. And uh, the data will be first of all in June be um, given to the farmers 
to consumers and neighbors who participated in the studies. And then we will publish it, I think, at the yeah, end of the year or begin next year, because we have a huge amount of, of, of data now from, from all these different uh, environmental compartments. But we are in contact uh, with the European Commission as well to tell them what we find. That there, nobody of you can say which of these concentrations are cancerous or not. What do we find in the dust? And then you, you get it with the water, you eat it, and the mixtures of the pesticides we are finding. So, and we are making then ecotox tests and new toxicological tests where we take this resilience as an indicator into consideration because it is a the strong evidence, you know, the, the medical people here know it better than me, that changes in gut microbiome uh, may cause neurological uh, diseases. And so uh, we are taking this into consideration as well, together with the experts, uh, toxicologists, who are doing this part. And we are informing the, the European Commission and we are informing EFSA. Now we only have to state uh, what is in the environment in the different compartments. And we are starting now with the ecotox test, and the tox test will start in, in um, October. So if one of you, the experts, <coughs> we don't test cancerogenity, <coughs> that uh, is not our duty. We test uh, the other forms of uh, toxicity. If one of you would give us an advice what to do, what to include, any idea, it's always welcome. You can find our homepage, Sprint, in the, in the presentation as well, my email address. So if one of you has ideas what we could take into consideration, what we should take into consideration, please uh, give us the ideas. And as well, we would like to, we have a strong component in the project for the transition of agriculture to more sustainable agriculture. Here as well, if the European Parliament has ideas what we should take into consideration, we are building now success stories from farmers who have done the transition uh, strongly reducing pesticides, not using glyphosate anymore, and having a good uh, income and having healthy soils, increasing the, 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 having good uh, productions. So we are trying now to make a narrative to show it is possible um, to avoid this threat. <laughs> the narrative of the threat, we will all starve of hunger if we forbid or we reduce the pesticides allowed in Europe. This is a very strong narrative, which is always repeated and repeated. The years go down, people will die in hunger in Africa if we don't produce in, in Europe so much. So it's very important to reduce this narrative and show conclusions which are there, which are implemented on European ground, and to show it's possible. There is no need to continue in after World War II's <laughs> technologies, and that is glyphosate. And I think it is, exactly. as I see how difficult it is in this, all these, these issues you, you were describing, lucky, yeah, I'm luckily not in these, all these uh, administrative issues, how difficult it is to get through, I think, make the people clear and awareness that we are not living in 1970 anymore. And maybe this helps, and there are solutions. So uh, maybe this awareness building would be very important. We are working on this as well each point. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, it is very clear that we, that we need a lot of activity from all fronts and we need each other. That is uh, indeed very clear. It is really um, incredible after the, the last saga, I would say, on glyphosate to see that we still have to repeat uh, the same arguments. And, um, and this can be a bit uh, causing a bit of desperation, you know, about the, the, the need for the application of the precautionary principle, for better independence rules, for uh, new benchmarks, for more sensitive uh, protocols. Um, so indeed it is, I think, uh, a good idea also to to sometimes step sideways and to, to look for um, more activity on, on uh, uh, general awareness raising. But somehow we also need to really um, crack that bastion, you know, that bastion of, of, uh, of powers that holds uh, the system in place, right? The, the, uh, the political power of the farm lobby that is uh, together with the pesticide industry that is promoting precisely now this narrative using the Ukraine war. 
um, in order to avoid uh, pesticide reduction, which the Commission is now wanting to propose. Um, now, with, with glyphosate, we are dealing with, with even uh, a whole host of issues that keep uh, the, the, the um, uh, authorization or the product on the market. Uh, and, and that we have seen today is, uh, is happening on, on many different levels. And it, it goes from, uh, as I just said, the protocols to the fact that the formulations are tested uh, or they're not tested, they are assessed somewhere else. Uh, at, the, at the national level rather than at the EU level and in not such a uh, not a thorough way at all. Uh, so we have a lot of issues to deal with. We have also a lot to build on from last time around. So I would say despite the very disappointing um, opinion yesterday from IGA, uh, we will not let this go. Uh, we will uh, talk to EFSA, we will talk to uh, the Commission that will finally make the proposal. We will be talking to the member states uh, that will all have to agree uh, on, a, on the next authorization. And we will be making all these points about the flaws in the risk assessment and also uh, the, the general impact on uh, the environment and the widespread presence already uh, with unknown consequences uh, on human health and on ecosystems. So I think uh, I will leave it to that. I want to thank you very much for your, for your presence uh, to all the participating participants uh, for your time and attention, to our speakers, uh, also to our uh, interpreter, uh, to French, and also to our technical people uh, who have made this happen uh, behind the scenes. Uh, and uh, of course, also to our hosts, the members of the European Parliament. So I wish you a very good uh, rest of the day. And uh, hopefully um, we will be seeing more progress on these issues in, uh, in the coming year and uh, the next few years. Thank you very much.